everyone, Mark Meckler here. Welcome to the Sunday Night Battle Cry. And I'm going to start tonight not by jumping forward, but sort of by rewinding a little bit. And what I mean by rewind is I want to kind of reset why we're here every Sunday night, why I'm here every Sunday night. I mean, this is a place that I look forward to being. If I'm not traveling or there's not some kind of a holiday, you're going to find me right here in the library. You can see behind me. Maybe you can't see him. It's a little blurry. That's my trusty Steed Levi there on the couch. There. He just sat up for you to show off his handsome countenance. Anyway, I'm here every Sunday. I'm here with Levi and I'm here in the library. And the reason I'm here is because there's a lot of stuff going on. And I get a question a lot. And producer G told me we've been getting this question a lot, which is why do I do the battle cry? Like, what is the purpose of coming here every Sunday night and doing this? And so I just kind of wanted to summarize and tell you how this got started and what it means to me and why I do this. And the real reason is there's a lot of stuff going on in the country and I'm interested in all of it. You know, I'm a person who absorbs a lot of political news, a lot of economic news, a lot of world news, a lot of science news, technology news, media news. I love being aware of the world around me and I see a lot of interesting stuff every week. And I actually see stuff that concerns me pretty much every week. And so what I try to do here is this is just kind of a personal sit down with me in my library every Sunday night. This is how I start my week. You know, I've had my day off. I've had my day of rest, day with the Lord, day with the family. And then I come to you and set my week. And I set it by kind of in my mind, recapping everything that happened last week in the news and politics and religion and whatever it is all across the country that I found personally interesting. Maybe it's not interesting to you. Maybe it's not useful to you. This is just a personal slice of the, all the stuff bopping around in my brain. I know that's kind of scary, but that's really what it is. That's why I do the battle cry, just to kind of give you insight onto what I'm thinking. A lot of times people ask me, what am I thinking about this issue or that issue, this international situation? Maybe it's what's going on in Haiti right now, something the president said. I kind of listen to the grassroots all week, listen to what they're interested in, and then I talk about it. And so that's what the battle cry is all about. I try and cram as much information as I can get into a half an hour. I tend to talk pretty fast. I tend to jump from subject to subject, but that's why I'm doing my best to respond to the things I hear from you guys on Facebook, on Twitter, wherever it might be on markmeckler.com. By the way, if you're not on markmeckler.com, you should do that. That's a, a place where I post stuff that I don't necessarily post elsewhere. I interact with folks at markmeckler.com. Go there, become a subscriber, interact with me. So that's why I do the Sunday Night Battle Cry. I also get uh, asked this question. If if COS is my main thing, which I think you can see by the hat, by the logo up here in the corner, by the shirt I'm wearing that says, I will not comply with the will of tyrants, that COS and get that in our store. That's my thing, right? I am the COS guy. I'm the founder or the co-founder of the COS Project, COS Action, COS Foundation. So why all this other stuff, right? Why not just focus on COS? And the answer is, I think COS is incredibly important. I think organizing around the call for a convention of states is incredibly important. I think getting to a convention of states, I think proposing amendments, ratifying amendments, I think making those necessary structural changes is all really important stuff. I also think it's not enough. And I've never been a person that's been focused on a single thing. One, just on a personal level, I love to do a lot of stuff. I get bored if I'm just doing one thing. I'm interested in so many different things. Number two, I think a single-minded approach to politics and to our society, it's just not broad enough. I think there's so much stuff going on. There's so much stuff that's gone wrong. There's so much stuff that needs to be made right that if I don't engage, if we don't engage in a whole bunch of it, we're still going to lose the country. But COS is here, Convention of States is here to make the change that's necessary structurally for the restoration of self-governance in America. What I mean by that is we've broken the structure of our system of governance. We were supposed to have a federal government of limited enumerated powers. And instead what we've ended up was because of the courts really a federal government of unlimited unenumerated powers. A lot of that power taken from you and me and taken from the states. So we gotta fix that structure. We got a culture that's a mess, right? We got a situation in this country where the culture has degraded, our morals have degraded. We got to fix that too. And by the way, that's not going to be fixed by a convention of states. So I care about that. We got schools that are a mess. Our schools from kindergarten on up through post-secondary education, they're a mess, right? I know you would all agree with me. So we got to fix those schools. You're going to see next week, we're going to be launching a big effort 
uh, maybe the beginning of the following week, uh, the initial website, I'm going to get a look at it. Uh, this is a project is going to be called Every School Board. We're going to teach you how to identify your school board, how to go visit your school board, how to watch what's going on in the meetings, how to testify, how to run for school board, how to run a school board. Once you take over the school board, you're going to take over every school board in America. We're going to help you do that because we got to fix our schools, right? So these are all important pieces. I think what's going on in the world, being aware of China and what's going on in China and the danger, the existential danger that China poses, being understanding our geo, geopolitical foes, our geopolitical friends, how much involvement we should have, how much we shouldn't. I think understanding the presidency, what's going on with the president or what's not going on with the president really nowadays, I think that's important to all of us. So there are so many issues that I think are important, that are important to me, that I just want to share with you. And I want you guys to be able to ask me questions about them, about anything, about any subject matter. Nothing is off limits. And so this is kind of a place for a free-for-all. And yes, my main project is the Convention of States project, but I'm involved in a lot of other political projects across the country. And I hope I'm a model for you. I'm going to be involved here locally in our school board fight. I hope you're going to do the same. I'm involved in local elections. I'm involved in state elections. I'm involved in federal elections. I hope you're going to do the same. And so that's why we talk about so many different things here on the Battle Cry every week, because not enough to just do convention of states. I think it's really important, but I don't think it's enough. All right, I get this question a lot too. What do I think are the most significant threats facing our country today? And what can COS do about it? And what can other things do about it? What can we do elsewise to do things about it? So look, I, I described this. I think one of the most significant threats facing the nation today are structural changes we've made in our system of governance. One of those would be the growth and the overgrowth and the overreach of the administrative state. Look, I think the administrative state is mostly unconstitutional. I don't think there's authority for the United States Congress to delegate the power of lawmaking to all of these administrative agencies, but they've done it anyway. They don't really care what we think. So we're going to have to rein that in. I think it's really important that we're involved in this and convention of states is a way to do that. We should do it politically through our elections as well and demand that these uh, senators, congressmen, and in the states, state legislators, assemblymen, representatives, senators, they rein in the administrative state as well. So I think that's one of the big internal threats is this restructuring that's been done in the favor of an unaccountable administrative state. I think executive overreach is really bad. This idea of the president and, and having these executive powers that are unbounded essentially through executive orders. I also think Congress has voluntarily given away much of its power to the executive. And so the power balance is broken. Externally, I think one of the biggest threats, I said it already, is the CCP. It's the existential threat of China and their overarching total sense of war. I'm reading a book right now called Unlimited Warfare. It's the Chinese view of what war looks like in this century. And what it looks like is everything. If you read the book Unlimited Warfare, you'll see what they think. It's from their perspective. It's really scary. I mean, they envision the internet as a war space. They envision your media as a war space. You see them taking over our culture and influencing as our culture. That's part of the war to them. So I think we need to be awake to what the CCP is doing, the Communist Chinese Party. I think that's important. I think wokeism in America is incredibly dangerous today. That is part of Marxism. Really, it's an attack on the fabric of our society. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. We can be involved in all of these things. Look, on the international scale, we're involved by being aware and then electing people who are doing the things we think they should do and by pressuring them to do those things by talking openly about China, about the threat of CCP. Look, China and the CCP today are Nazis. And look, it's a big deal to say they're Nazis. I take this seriously. I don't call people Nazis, right? It's just not something that's appropriate. There's very little in this world that's evil, as evil as the Nazis were. The Chinese Communist Party are as evil, maybe more evil than the Nazis. They are practicing right now genocide on a mass scale, over 1 million Uyghur Muslims in concentration camps right now. They're practicing extermination. They're practicing or organ harvesting. They're practicing forced sterilization. Their intent is to do away with, to or to assimilate the remainder of the Uyghur population to force them out of their own culture. And this is genocide. 
it's just straight up genocide. It's the same as the Nazis. They use the same tips, the same techniques. They torture, they rape, they murder. It's ugly stuff. And we should call it out for what it is. And we should call out the companies like the NBA that are involved there with the CCP, like Disney that's involved there with the CCP, like all of these big media conglomerates that care about their profits in China more than they care about the evil that China is doing in the world. Imagine if it was the NBA and they were doing business with Nazis, because they are. Imagine if it were Disney and they were doing business with the Nazis, because they are, right? So this is what we have to understand. When these companies are doing business with the CCP, with the Chinese mainland, they're doing business with the Nazis. By the way, they're overrunning Hong Kong now. They've pretty much taken over Hong Kong, a free nation. We stood by and watched. Literally, we've abandoned our friends in Hong Kong. And we are doing the same, I think, in Taiwan. The Chinese are making noises about invading Taiwan. They're preparing for invading Taiwan, a free and independent nation. They say that's part of China and they're gonna take it over. So these are some of the existential threats facing the United States of America today. I think coming here and talking about these things, helping to educate you about these things, getting your questions and your opinion on these things, it's really important to me to hear from you. See, the battle cry is not just for me to talk at you, but I'm watching your comments. I'm watching your questions right now. I think this is really important. And, and really, look, the questions for me are important, whether they're about Convention of States or they're about other things. I'm, gonna, I'm looking at my notes here because a bunch of stuff I wanted to talk about today. I've been talking a lot lately about Marxism, about communism. And I get people who say to me pretty regularly, you know, Mark, I mean, isn't it a little bit radical to say that our opponents in America today are communists and Marxists? I mean, seems pretty inflammatory. I mean, they're Democrats, right? They're our political opponents. And my answer is they're communists. They're Marxists. And by the way, it's open. There are open Marxists in the Democratic Party today. This is not a secret anymore, right? And they, they ascribe to communist and Marxist ideologies. They support the Black Lives Matter movement. Black Lives Matter movement founded by avowed Marxists. The founders of Black Lives Matter say that they are trained Marxists. This is what they say. I'm not saying it. This was on their website. They've now removed this stuff. They say that their job is to destroy the prescribed Western nuclear family. That means your family. That means my family. That means the structures that you and I hold near and dear. These are Marxists. And they operate according to the tenets of Marxism. And we talk a lot now about wokeism as well, right? Specifically in the form of critical race theory. And I want you to understand that Marxism and critical race theory come from the same root. Critical theory is a fundamental theory of Marxism that comes out of Marxism through the Frankfurt School in Germany, through Alexander Gramsci in Italy, right? Who is an anti-fascist communist in Italy, to the U.S. infecting U.S. academia, and it's come through the century. This is where we get the idea of the long march through the institution and is now pollution in our society. So where does critical race theory come from? Critical theory says you criticize everything endlessly until you can destroy the structures of society and replace it with a Marxist utopia. So why critical race theory? And the reason for critical race theory is because critical theory and the attack on the classes and the class warfare doesn't work in the United States. And it doesn't work here because we have very mobile situation between classes, right? You can be born poor, you can become middle class, you can become wealthy. I know the left hates this, but you can lift yourself up by your bootstraps. We have incredible class mobility in the United States of America. We're the most mobile society on earth as far as class structure, right? So there's no you can't become part of the elite. You can't go to the best schools. You can't be wealthy if you start poor. You know how many stories we have of people who started poor then became middle class, started middle class, became wealthy, started poor, became wealthy. So that's entirely available to us in the United States of America. And so this class warfare thing that is normally Marxism, it just doesn't work in this country. And so they had to insert something else into critical theory. And what they inserted was class, or instead of class, race warfare, right? That's exactly what they wanted. They want us to hate each other because of our race. So they called it critical race theory. It's the same as critical theory. And the goal is destruction. The goal is to literally to destroy everything that we hold near and dear in our society, 
to make people hate each other, to tear the society apart so that they can rebuild from the ashes of Marxism and from the ashes of capitalism, from the ashes of, of our democratic republic, from the ashes of our constitutional republic, what they see as a Marxist utopia. We have to be aware of this. And that's why I talk about it. It's not radical on my side. It's radical on their side, right? Radicalism on our side in opposition to this defense of ext uh, extremism and the defense of our nation and the defense of virtue is not something to be ashamed of. We should be radicals in defending our constitution. We should be radicals in the defense of our society. We should be radicals in the defense of our morals and the defense of our values. We should not let them tear it down. And our battle cry this week, and you're going to hear me say this, our battle cry this week is to speak the truth, is to stand up, is to say the thing, is to identify our enemy. Speak truth loud, boldly. You might be embarrassed to do it, but we've got to do it. We've got to call Marxism, Marxism. We've got to call critical race theory, critical race theory. I actually call it state-sponsored racism, and we have to do it loudly, boldly, everywhere we go, everywhere we hear this garbage. This is what I'm going to, my call for this week, stand and name the enemy. That's your job. Not just me. I do it. I'll do it every week here. I'll do it every time I'm on television. I'll do it every time I give a speech. It's not enough for me to do it. You have to do it too, and you have to do it in your everyday life. All right, let's keep going down my, my outline here. Uh, there were questions I want to hit. Okay, here's, here's the next phase. We've got Marxists in our country. We've identified this. Look, the Democratic Party is a Marxist institution now. So let's just put that on the shelf. Note that. That's back there on the shelf behind me. The Democrats are Marxists. Here's something else you need to know. The Democrats in this country, the Democrat Party, is the party of racism. Not that, I notice I didn't say it was the party of racism. That's true, but it still is. It always has been the party of racism. The Democrat Party is an unbroken stream of racist hate from its beginning, through its middle, and to the current day. The Democrats are racist. Very interesting. Marxists are always racist too. These two things go hand in hand. If you look at what the Chinese are doing, Chinese society is actually one of the most racist societies on earth. They are committing a racial genocide right now. Chinese people are racist against Chinese people. The Han Chinese are considered the high Chinese. And if you're some other ethnic Chinese, you're not Han, then you, there is racist discrimination against you. We are the least racist nation in the world. The least. But there is a racist institution. There is institutional racism in this country. The left talks all the time about institutional racism. It does exist. It is called, and we should call it by name, the Democrat Party. They are racists. They have always been racist. Look, let's run a little history here. Let's do a history lesson, all right? So prior to the Civil War, the Democrats in the South who held slaves were racist, right? We would all agree with that. They were Democrats. They were not Republicans. There were no Republicans back then. We fought a civil war and the Democrat Party are the party that fought the civil war to preserve racism. The Republican Party, by the way, was founded specifically to abolish slavery. It was the abolitionist party. It was a radical abolitionist party that was willing to wage war to do away with slavery. The Democrats fought to preserve slavery. After the war, who fought to preserve slavery, to preserve the institutions of racism? That's right. Southern Democrats fought to preserve slavery. That's exactly what happened. We had the institution of Jim Crow laws. What were those? Those were Democrats instituting laws to keep black people from voting, from owning property. The first gun control laws in this country massively passed by white Democrats in the South to keep black people from owning guns so that they couldn't defend themselves. The Ku Klux Klan, founded by the Democrat Party as their military wing to enforce keeping black people down, keeping black people from voting, keeping black people from owning businesses 
keeping black people from owning property, keeping black people from going to school. The Klan was instituted by the Democratic Party. It's insane. It's crazy. When you get into World War II, by the way, of course, we still have racism in the South. It's all Democrats. Republicans in the North oppose it. You get into World War II, and you have Japanese internment by race. Pure, straight-up racial hatred and discrimination imposed by a Democrat president, right? Who integrated the military? Eisenhower, a Republican. Like this is a, this is the history, right? Woodrow Wilson, one of the greatest progressive heroes of all time, wrote a racist history of the United States of America erasing all black people. He showed a Ku Klux Klan movie in the White House. It was the first movie ever shown in the White House. Not a Republican, a Democrat. Jump forward to the 1960s and the civil rights movement. Who led the civil rights movement? Oh, Martin Luther King, a Republican, not a Democrat. The Democrats widely opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There was a filibuster, we know what that is, against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Longest filibuster in American history. I believe it was 74 days of a filibuster by Democrats ultimately busted by the majority of Republicans getting some Democrats to cross over and vote in favor of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. One of the things that drives me most insane when I fly into Austin is there's a big sign that says LBJ, the civil rights president. Lyndon Baines Johnson, the civil rights president. Lyndon Baines Johnson was a racist who consistently and constantly used the N-word, who denigrated black people, who attacked black people regularly. Okay, he signed the Civil Rights Act because he had to. It had been passed by Congress. The public was in favor of it. He had to do it. He did it against his own party, against the majority of his own party, and he was an abject racist. There are tapes, lots of them, of him saying horribly offensive things against black people. In the 1960s, this is the modern era. Who opposed integration even after the 1964 Civil Rights Act? The Democrats. Okay, and where are we at today? Who's trying to impose racism on America today? Is it Republicans? Now, that's what they'll tell you. But who says that people should be judged by the color of their skin and not the content of their character? Oh, wait, that's all progressives and Democrats. Who says that we should give people jobs or not give people jobs based on the color of their skin and not the content of their character? Democrats, the racist Democrats. Who says that there are too many Asians getting into Harvard and we have to do something to keep them out. Those are leftists. Those are Democrats discriminating once again against Asians because of their skin color, because of their heritage, because of their race. Democrats are racist. Democrats say that if you're white, in other words, because of your race, then you are an oppressor and you are racist, even if you don't know it. Democrats say if you are black or any other person of darker color skin, then you are a victim and you are a oppressed because of the color of your skin. That is racist. So we're going to say it loud. We're going to name our enemy. The racists are our enemies, and those are Democrats. That's the Democratic Party today. That's the progressives today. Who is anti-Semitic in America today? Oh, wait, what do you know? That's the Democratic Party, anti-Israel. And it's not just anti-Israel, it's anti-Semitic. Those are the Democrats. They are racist. I'm just going to keep saying it. The Democrats are the party of racism. They believe in racism. They've always believed in racism. They have an unbroken history of racism in the United States of America. And I'm going to say it bluntly and boldly, shame on you. If you're a Democrat today and you don't think you're a racist, then you damn well better leave your party. I'm not saying be a Republican, be whatever you want to be, leave, be an independent. But unless you identify with a long history of racism, if you believe in structural racism, which you do, that's what the Democratic Party is all about. Your party is built on a structure, a history, a pile of terrible stuff that is all racist. That is the Democratic Party. By the way, where's abortion come from? It comes from the liberal eugenicist Margaret Sanger, right? Abortion, Planned Parenthood, supported by Democrats, founded by Margaret Sanger, a eugenicist, 
to control the spread of the Negro, as she put it. Racism, plain and simple. Know your enemy, call your enemy out. Name your enemy. That's the battle cry this week. Name your enemy. All right, I'm going to give you a brief COS update. We're going to go to questions and answers. Brief COS update. Everything's going well. I'm super excited. Our staff retreat is this week. We're going to be getting together in Colorado, a whole bunch of us. The staff, national staff, has grown incredibly. I remember just a few years ago, there were 10 of us or so. Now there are over 50 of us. We're coming together from all over the country. We're going to get together. We're going to share some fellowship. We're going to break bread together. We don't have an office. We run a low-budget operation. We spend our money on target, making it happen. North Carolina House has passed. South Carolina House just passed. Wisconsin Assembly recently passed. We're moving on to the Senate and all of those places. Came out of the committee in Nebraska. We'll be on the floor in Nebraska. I would say the closest, most important thing we're fighting for right now is the North Carolina Senate. If you're in North Carolina, you're not involved, get involved. Go to conventionofstates.com. Send your petition. Click the Take Action tab. Volunteer to be involved in North Carolina. If you got a senator in North Carolina, call them up. <coughs> Excuse me. The Senate is what matters right now in North Carolina. So that's the status. That's what we got going on in the coming week. I'm going to go to Producer G. He's got a bunch of questions over here for me. All right. It says, uh, do you think the corporations are so woke because they're afraid their taxes will go higher if they don't support the government? No, I think they're so woke because the woke people scream the loudest. Look, we saw what happens when we scream and we got to start screaming. We got to start naming the enemy. Coca-Cola got involved in the Georgia voting rights stuff and Georgia passed a good voting integrity act, right? It expanded actual voting availability. I think too much personally, but it, it made more early voting, made it easier for people to vote early, but it required voter ID. It had some other restrictions on it and Coca-Cola got involved and Delta got involved and people got pissed and they backed down. When there was a second round of trying to get involved, have these corporations step up, they wouldn't because you yelled, you screamed. you. Ca I called the CEO of Delta and left a message. I wrote emails to Delta's customer service and told them I was trying not to fly Delta anymore. I'm a Delta million miler, but I've been trying not to. On my retreat, I'm flying United. I could fly Delta, but I could fly United just as easily. So I went United. I'm anti-Delta at this point. So we got to make sure that if they get woke, they go broke. Mostly it's woke people yelling at them that scares them. Also, their woke employees inside yell at them. We need to put on more heat. Again, name your enemy. That's the battle cry. Be open about it. All right. Shipwright says, why am I not hearing about convention states and right-leaning media? Blessings from Tarpon Springs, Florida. I would tell you, you know, maybe you're just not listening at the right time in the right place. I did seven television hits. No, 10, 10 total media hits on, I think it was on Thursday. I probably did 25 media hits this week, so lots of stuff on convention estates. Jenny Halford says, how many states in for COS now? It's 15. I mentioned the three who just passed the house, uh, so that could make it 18. Simon Water says, what do you think is the plan when the Arizona audit release uh, results are released? Look, I don't know, Simon. We have to first see what those results are. And I think we should be auditing every state, every jurisdiction that's in question. I don't know what the audit's going to show. I'm, look, I'm a lawyer. Show me the proof. You know, that's what I want to know. Show me the proof. I want to see the proof in the numbers, the actual evidence. I'll believe my eyes when I see them. I don't believe what the left says. I don't believe the right's accusations until I see the proof. I think there's enough to make me concerned and worried and anxious about it. So I'm waiting to see the results of the audit. Ron Helton says, who's going to promote CRT if there's no longer any government funded education? Well, look, Ron, I mean, if we could get away with government, get away from completely government funded education, I'm all in favor of that. I think there are two approaches to what to do with education. One is because it exists right now, we should be trying to take it over. We can't just sit back quietly. We name the enemy. We go after, we fight the enemy. We defeat the enemy. Your choice, stand or stand down, right? We're going to stand. But if we could get away with public funded education, hallelujah, I'm all in favor of that. Robert Holmes says, what's the number one thing we can do to help you, Mark? All right, number one thing right now, if you're not already there, go to conventionofstates.com, click sign the petition, sign it, then go click take action and volunteer in your own state. And this is what I need. I, I'm tired of all the BS organizations. Oh, we got grassroots. We got a million people. No, you don't. You got an email list. The question is, do you have people in the fight? 
Do you have activists that are active? So I'm telling you, sign up, get involved with your local convention of states organization. We're doing state meetings all around the country right now, the statewide leadership teams. Uh, this weekend, I did Connecticut, Alabama, one other, I forget what it was, but all over the country. And you should see the leadership teams are large and growing. You need to be on those leadership teams. So I would say that's the number one thing you can do. We're going to be initiating this fight at the school board level. You can help us with that. Run for school board. Go to a school board meeting. See what's going on. Figure out what their policies are and all this woke crap. Get involved, object, and fight at the local level. Look, on a battle cry, I'm always going to tell you what the action item is. And the action item for this week is name your enemy. Name your enemy. Call the Marxist the Marxist. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it down really simply, and then I'm going to close. Here's the deal. You're going to be sitting around a dinner table. Maybe you're a grandparent. Maybe you're a parent with adult kids. And you're going to be sitting there, and somebody's going to say, you know, the country is really systemically racist. And you're going to think, I really don't want to fight with the kids. I really don't want to cause problems in my family. Ben Franklin and his son were on opposite sides of the American Revolution. You think they wanted to fight in the family? No, but they understood something existential was at risk. Ben Franklin understood he wasn't going to do the wrong thing to placate his son so they could have a nice Sunday night dinner. You're going to be at work and somebody's going to say one of these insane things. They're going to tell you, you know, gender is fluid and men can be women. Women can be men. There are birthing people. Like men can have babies. And you're going to think, I don't really want to make a big deal. No, name your enemy. No, that's ridiculous. You're a science denier. Men are men. It's genetic. It's biology. It's, it is actually moral. It's what God said. It's how God created men and women. It's what biology says. It's what science says. What you're saying is anti-science. It's crazy. I'm not going to sit here and listen to that stuff. Name your enemy. Be in the fight. You're going to be at church and somebody's going to say one of these things. No. Name your enemy, right? You have to say these things out loud. You have to be bold. You have to sacrifice. You have to be willing to take the risk. I need you to name your enemy. You have two choices. You are going to stand up or you are going to stand down. And if you stand down, we're going to lose the country. And I'm not going to let that happen on my watch. If there's anything I can do about it, John Quincy Adams said, duty is ours. The results belong to God. God bless you guys. Thanks for watching the battle cry. I'll be back here next week. We'll do this all over again.